kids if you're participating in that this morning and we are going to dig in to the book of revelation at the very end of the bible it's uh the passages we're going to zero in on today are in your handout this morning or flip or click your way there if you have your own bible with you i find stories about the future intriguing and i think my favorite genre of movie is you know the action-packed thriller where you know the world is facing some kind of evil or there's some catastrophic event that's that's coming you know the super volcano at yellowstone is about to blow up or a comet is headed toward earth uh, some disaster is threatening to destroy the world and out of the mix of it and out of the turmoil of it some unexpected superheroes rise to the surface and they save the world and they save the day and in the end, good prevails and hope wins. I like stories like that. Revelation is the ultimate super action thriller of all time. And we're going to see that as we, we go through it. There's drama. There's suspense. There's passion. There's mystery. There's even some scary stuff in there. But it's very much a book of hope. That in the end, good prevails because it's, it comes in the person of, of Jesus. A book with a happy ending is Revelation. A book that builds hope when we're facing uncertainties for the future. A book where the superhero emerges and his name is Jesus. And he puts his hands on people and he encourages them. It's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. We have the victory. Don't fear. I don't know if you remember as we studied through the book of Matthew, the baptism scene where when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, it says in, in Matthew 4 that the heavens were opened. Or Matthew 3. The heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove and the voice of the Father, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And I love that scene, if you can envision it, when Jesus was being baptized, it says the heavens were open and glory was revealed in that moment of Jesus' baptism. As we study Revelation, we are going to get these glimpses of the heavens open and we get these glimpses of incredible worship and the presence of Jesus as the superhero of all time, as the savior of the world who wins the day. So if you have your Bible, I'd like us to just jump in and read the first eight verses as a start this morning. Revelation 1. This is the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that soon must take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. This letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. From the sevenfold spirit before his throne and from Jesus Christ, he is the faithful witness to these things the first to rise from the dead, the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins 
by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God, his Father. All glory and power to him forever and forever. Amen. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. Wow, that's the setting. That's what we're jumping into, this tremendous story. You know, many of us are fascinated about the future, and this is the ultimate truth of the future. It's, it's the accurate truth that is foretold to us. What is coming in our world? It's coming from the Bible, and it's true, this revelation about our future. But it's also a book about the past and the present and how those work into God's eternal plan for the future. So we dare not miss both the present and the past as we think about the future. They all go together in God's economy. So for a little background of this book as we jump into it, the author is John, same guy who wrote the Gospel of John, and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, those three letters of John. And there's several principal approaches, really, as, as we open the study of, of this book. A couple things to just establish as some foundations as we enter into this study of Revelation. First of all, it's really wise to consider the historical context, the author's intent, and the culture of the original readers, the first people who were reading it. It's good to put ourselves in, the, in their shoes and understand the setting of those early readers. Honestly, any book of the Bible that we study, it's good to start there. What is the historical setting? What is going on as the author wrote it? What, is the, what did the early readers, what did they understand based on what was going on in their world? It expands our, and deepens our, our understanding of the passage of the book as we do that. So many of you have a study Bible. And that's a good practice to do at the beginning of a study Bible. As a, as a book unfolds, there's, there's a section that talks about the historical setting and the culture and what the author was thinking when he wrote his book, when God was using him to pen those words that, that come from him. So that, that's wise. And often when I study a book, I'll use commentaries, which, you know, scholarly people who study the original language and the historical things and all, and all that, all the data, they study all that and then they write books about it. So... You would not believe how many books, how many commentaries about Revelation there are out there. Just in my personal library, my, my study books, my commentaries on the book of Revelation, that, that section on my shelf is much bigger than any other book of the Bible. There are so many books written about Revelation. There are so many interpretations of the book of Revelation. There's so much understanding of the book of Revelation that it takes a lot to study it. So I'm going to do my best to study all the opinions and all the thoughts and all the history I can and bring to you the nuts and bolts and the cliff notes and, and hopefully that will help us to get the principles and the really big things that God wants us to see. As you think of all the books that are written about Revelation, and some of you have gone through studies of Revelation and you've been exposed to some of those books, there's, there's a, a whole line of people that take Revelation completely literally that every figure of speech, that everything that is presented, that every image that is there has a literal meaning. There's others who take the, the, the whole opposite, that it's figurative, that these are symbolic of things, and so we can figure out that symbolism. I, I want you to know that I'm camping out right in the middle. I'm studying both, because I think there's merit. There's not an either-or all the time. Sometimes there are places where it's absolutely, if you don't study the literal sense of this, you're going to miss something. And likewise, if you don't study the figurative part of that and what they would understand, you're going to miss something. So I'm working hard on that and enjoying it as we study this book. For us, it's good to know a little bit about the historical setting and the culture of those early days. So in verse 4, it actually tells us that this book comes to us in the form of a letter written to the churches. That's good to know. And it's, it's a letter written to the church. Sometimes in my past I've thought, you know, each church got their individual letter. Nobody else knew it. But it's a letter to the churches. So all the churches were hearing what the other churches were hearing. So what they said about Laodicea, the people in Ephesus were hearing what was said about each church. And that can 
and form our understanding of these letters as we put ourselves into the picture of Revelation chapter 1. So, secondly, a, another kind of foundational guideline for us. We look at the historical setting of the early readers and what the author's intent was. And it's important to know this. Some of Revelation has actually either been fulfilled or at least partially fulfilled. That's good to know. Because every generation can look at the book of Revelation and, and point to things in, in it and say, oh, yes, this is it. We are definitely in the end times. Every generation, we talked about this with Matthew 24 last week, every generation needs to embrace the truth that we don't know when he's coming and it could be at any time we are called to be ready. And every generation has to live in that readiness and that anticipation and that expectation of the return of Jesus. He said he was coming back and we know that he is. Now, there's, there's a picture. Uh, the next slide there. The book of Revelation has this, remember that picture I showed when we did Daniel? Yes. And we would get this, as we live up here and we're, we're familiar with the Trinity Alps. The, let me explain it this way in terms of partial fulfillments and bigger fulfillments to come. When you look at that mountain range, it looks like just one mountain range. You can't see it really well on that picture, but it looks like you can envision this with the Trinities. You look at the Trinities and you, it looks like one mountain range. But we know if you hike up into those mountains, it's not just one range. There's an initial range, and then there's a big valley in between, and then there's another range. Understanding that is important for planning a trip up into the Trinities. There's just a one mountain range that you have to climb. You get over one, and you realize, oh, there's a whole other range up there. It's like that with prophecy. And the next slide shows this. There, if you put a timeline on, on Revelation... The book of Revelation was written right after, you know, not long after Jesus died and went to heaven. And the book of Revelation was written. John had his vision. So he is seeing from early until the future. And if you look at a mountain range from the side, this is just kind of a picture to try and diagram this, this concept. Looking at a mountain range from a different angle, you see there's a peak, there's a mountain range, then there's a big valley of time, then there's another mountain range. And then there's the ultimate mountain range where we know Jesus is returning. And at any of these points, people in history could look at that and look at the book of Revelation and say, this is it, World War II, this, right there. World War II, this is it, this is. And there have been prophecies fulfilled during these mountain ex experiences. There have been partial fulfillments of things. Actually, right away after Jesus ascended to heaven in AD 70, the, Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. And people at that time thought, this is it. This is the abomination that causes desolation that Daniel talked about. This is the fulfillment. Jesus is coming. The temple has been destroyed. And now we know he is coming. And every generation since has these partial fulfillments. But we know there is the ultimate fulfillment yet to come. Yes. And as we saw in Matthew 24 last week, the signs of our times, the, the signs of the fig tree that is ripening, I believe we are in those times, and I believe we need to be ready and expectant and anticipating his soon return. So the third thing I want to mention in terms of this study is some, just some ground uh, I, thoughts and foundations. Third thing is that we want to keep the main thing the main thing. We want to have the main thing as the main thing. It's very, really, really easy in a book like Revelation to get sidetracked in the details of what's going on and take too much time studying individual things that are happening and images that are presented. We always want to be able to back up, especially when a book like Revelation comes to us, back up and say, what's the main thing? What is the big idea of this passage that if I miss that, I'm going to miss what's really important? And the central message of the book of Revelation is, yes, about, about the end times and what is coming and the return of Christ, but there's so much more to it than that. There's this expectancy, there's this readiness that we want to have. All of history is moving toward this expected day when Jesus comes, Satan is conquered, the kingdom of darkness is overwhelmed by the kingdom of light, and we are entering into a time of hope forever. And so there's history in the book of Revelation, and there's present day in their cultural setting, and even for us, there's present day things that we can apply to our lives. And there's future 
that we can really be anticipating as we read this, this book. So all of it leads to an optimistic faith that builds hope. And as we will see, we get these glimpses, and when the heavens are open and we get these glimpses of heaven, what is happening frequently as foundational in the book of Revelation, when we get a glimpse into the eternal kingdom, what we see is worship <laughs> with Jesus as the superhero of the story, the Lamb of God, the King of Kings, and worship is happening. So I, this morning, I want to just take three broad strokes on this book of Revelation. Three big things that we can get, three calls to Revelation. Three calls that we can zero in on from the book of Revelation. So here's the first one. At its most basic level, Revelation is a call to worship. To worship of the King of Kings. It says in verse 1, this is the revelation or the apocalypsis in the original language, meaning unveiling. Because God wants to reveal, not conceal. He wants to reveal things to us that give us taste of the eternal kingdom because that builds optimistic faith and hope for the future. So he gives us these glimpses of an eternity where worship is really happening in the heavenlies. So this book of Revelation is, is prophecy. Verse 3, blessing is it. It's a blessing to those who hear the words of this prophecy. And that's said repeatedly. Chapter 22 brings that up and accents that. These words of prophecy. And so this revelation properly defined is, is prophecy. But it's not just about the future. It's about the past. And it's about the present. As is prophecy for us today. Sometimes we get this notion in our head that prophecy is all about the future. Prophecy really is correctly dividing the word of truth, properly understanding the Bible, and bringing it into, yes, off in the future, but also right now. This has implications for me now. And there are things from the past that I can learn from that will help me to understand what is, what is being said. And all of this, what is being revealed, God wants to reveal, and what he is revealing is worship. Now, what does that look like? In this passage, we get, some, we get some tastes of what kingdom worship looks like, what the eternal kingdom, and what can, we can anticipate in the future. I want to say a few things about worship and what we can glean from worship in this passage that we read this morning. First of all, true worship is Christ-centered. It says in verse 1, this is the revelation from Jesus Christ. This is from him. This is about him. This is for him. This is to him. This is in him. It really is all about Jesus. If you want the bottom line to the book of Revelation, worship Jesus, the King of Kings. He is the centerpiece of the entire book. He is the one that we zero our eyes in on. So true worship is really Christ-centered. That's what we read this morning in, at the very beginning in chapter 4. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. This is worship happening around Jesus in the center on the throne. A beautiful scene, tremendous worship scene. So true worship is Christ-centered, all about Jesus. If you've been going to the Elfos very long, I hope you've already picked that up, but we, we are all about Jesus. It's about Jesus. He is the one we chase after. He's the one we're hungry for. He's the one that we worship. It's really a Christ-centered church that we want to be. Worship also involves service, right? We, we call this historically a worship service because we're here to serve up worship to God who is worthy of it. And it does something for us when we enter into these times of worship where we're just praising him and honoring him and thinking about him and showing gratitude for him. That kind of worship fuels our soul and it taps in to what's going on in the heavenlies in our eternal future. I hope that you have these moments on Sunday mornings when we gather like this, where kind of in a way the, the heavens are being opened a little bit and you're getting a glimpse of eternity in worship unto Jesus, the King. It's profound to think in those terms. Worship involves service. But it's not just about Sunday mornings. Worship involves service out in the community. Any time that we serve other people, 
in, in our vision statement is we want to go deeper with Jesus, help each other go deeper in our walk with Jesus, to love Jesus more. And out of that flows a love for other people, to, to serve the world with his love, to serve up some love to our world. That's why we believe we're here, to love Jesus and press deeper into that together and to let that overflow into our community, to love the community with the love of God. And if I am allowing the, my love for God to overflow into ministering to other people and serving other people, that is worship. That is an act of worship. And if we are doing that during the week and getting these glimpses of eternity as we do so, when we get together on Sunday morning, that, that's just the overflow of a lifestyle of worship. That's what we're invited into in the book of Revelation. It's a call to worship with our lives. And it says something about service here. Notice in verse 1, this is the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. Did you catch that? The events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant, John. You see this over and over again in the scriptures. We are called servants. And as we serve, things are revealed to us. Don't miss that important part of this, this passage. Those words show his servant and present this revelation to his servant, John. When we lean into that and become servants of the king, anytime that we're actually serving out in our community, knowing that Jesus is with us in that moment, we are learning things about Jesus and his kingdom. He is revealing things to us as we live a lifestyle of service, as worship unto the king. So we're called to be Christ-centered. We're called to serve in our worship. Notice in verse 2 and 3, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is the report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says. That's another aspect of worship. Worship is Christ-centered. Worship is service. Worship is also centered on the Word, the Word of God. We believe that here at the Outpost, that this is God's Word. It's inspired. And what this Word does is it reveals to us the living Word of the written Word. This takes us into the heart of Jesus. And as we read it and study it and realize that it helps us to interact with Jesus, who is the living Word of all of it, all of a sudden, this isn't just words, it's living and active because it takes us to Jesus, who is living and active. And when we study it and obey it and walk it out and believe it, we are encountering more and more of the presence of Jesus, and we get to know him more and more. We want to serve him more and more, and we get to worship him in deeper, greater ways as we focus ourselves on his word so that we can bring glory to God, as it says in, in verse 5, because there's, there's a lot of other things we could say about worship, and we'll get these other glimpses in Revelation about what worship looks like. We could say a lot more about that, but it all comes to this. Worship of God is to bring Him glory, to bring Him a blessing. That's what it says in verse 5. All glory to Him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding His blood for us. He gave it all for us. How could we possibly do anything less but to worship him with all that is within us, fully surrendered, wanting to get to know him more, the Savior who died, suffered and died for me. So Revelation at the basic foundational level is a call to worship. Something else, there's a second call to the book of Revelation. It is a call to spiritual battle. It's a call to battle, a battle of unequal proportions, honestly, a battle like no other. And it's a spiritual war. We talked about that in the past, and we talked about that last week with uh, Matthew chapter 24, and we've talked about how that influences our world today, and certainly how in the end times there is a rise in the level of satanic activity and, and darkness and the things that are going on, because the time is growing short, and the demonic, the kingdom of darkness, knows their time is short and they're pouring it on. Some of you know that with the lives that you're encountering right now and the things that are happening 
to you. It's a spiritual war, and it's a war of unequal proportion, and it's described. We get glimpses of it in the book of Revelation. But what really shines the light on our world today, and these moments when the heavens are open and the light is shining on our world, what it shines on is Jesus, and what it shines on for us as we study the Word of God and study this book of Revelation is the fact that we walk in the victory. We know that the end of the story, Jesus reigns and he rules. He will take charge and establish his kingdom, even though it's a spiritual war. This is a sub-theme, kind of. It's a, one of the themes in, in Revelation, that there is victory ahead. Satan, described as the dragon, the kingdom of darkness will be defeated. We'll see that in Revelation. And we see Jesus at the center of it as the one who does the conquering. And so last week we noted that, you know, we're called to be courageous soldiers in this war. Sometimes we need a hospital to get ourselves healed up so that we can go back to being soldiers, courageous soldiers. And when we read some of these things in Revelation, what is ahead for us and what is happening in our world today, even, we need to have courage to follow Jesus, to serve him, to worship him, and do that with a genuine heart. We need courage for that. And so Hebrews 10, we talked about last week, we get together so that we can fill each other with courage. Encourage each other. Because we are living in a world that's at war. There's a spiritual war going on. And we get glimpses of that in Revelation and what is ahead in terms of the victory. So Revelation is a call to worship. And it's a call to spiritual battle. And thirdly, Revelation is a call to follow Jesus. And that's not third in a, in a line any, any other than that's the accent mark. In fact, the entire Bible... All of it points to this call, this truth. We are invited to follow Jesus. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are invited. It's a call to follow Jesus Christ. This is really what all the Bible is about. To know Christ, to get to know him better, and to follow him. Knowing he is the one that will carve the path towards victory. Whatever it is we face. And so in verse 1, this is the revelation from Jesus Christ. He is the one at the center of it all. And this, this call to follow him is a call that is designed, God wants us to know it's for now. It says he is coming soon. And that's not a timeline word. It's a word that means imminent. He's coming. And soon means be ready. Because no one knows the day or the hour or the moment it's going to happen but it is certain. That word soon indicates certainty. We can count on it. And we can build our lives of faith toward it. The call to follow him is now. And the call to follow him is a heart call. Notice in verse 3. Take to heart. Read the words of this prophecy. Take it to heart. That means revelation is a call to the heart that it helps us to live out our behaviors that come out of a heart in tune with Jesus. It leads us to deeper faith in Jesus. That's a call of revelation, a call to worship, a call to spiritual battle, a call to follow, a call to follow him now, and a call to follow him with all of our hearts, with all of our love, with all of our emotions, to follow him as the one who is so worthy of leading us. It's also a call as we follow him, to see him. I love the language in Revelation that points to the fact that all will see Jesus. And in verse 7, it's really in connection with Daniel 7 and Daniel's vision of the four beasts. Maybe you remember that when we studied that, that the prophet saw was like the Son of Man coming on the clouds. And all will see him. It's in Zechariah 12.10. Again, the prophet noted that the day of the Lord, the inhabitants of Jerusalem who look on the one they have pierced and mourned for him. That's language in Revelation being drawn for the Old Testament from the imagery there by the prophets. Every eye will see him. We heard that in the passage we read this morning. Every eye will see him. Every human being that has ever taken a breath will be face to face with Jesus. We will see him. And in that moment, we have to have been ready now knowing that when we see him later, 
He will say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome home to eternity. Because the only other thing that will be said is, depart from me because I never knew you. We are called to begin to see Jesus now so that our eternal future is secure. And when we see him, we already know we are going to see him in all of his expressions of love and glory and goodness. And he knows our name. He knows my name. And he welcomes me into eternity. That decision is the decision that is made in this life. Now, here, today, so that we are ready for the future. The call to follow him is, is a call to see him. And the, the call to follow him is a perfect call to a perfect person, a perfect God. You notice, uh, as we read this morning, we saw this number seven repeatedly. Did you, did you catch that? The number seven is, in the Bible, known as the number of perfection, completeness. You know, in seven days, God created the earth. Seven is known as a, as a perfect kind of number. It signifies perfection. And the word seven shows up 391 times in the Bible. And the number seven shows up in the book of Revelation 55 times. So it's an important number. And it's expressed even in Revelation chapter 1. We have seven churches, and we're going to explore the seven letters that were written to the seven churches. And in verse 4, and in, again in verse 11 and 12, we have these seven lampstands. And verse 16, the seven stars. And verse 20, and the, the important part of the truth is, uh, to see in this is Jesus is the perfect one. In the center of it all, Jesus is standing in the middle of the lampstand. Jesus is standing in the middle of the churches. Jesus is the centerpiece. Jesus is standing in the middle of Trinity County. He's in control. He's the one that holds us together. He's the one that we worship. And he is a perfect Savior. We can count on the fact that whatever he does is a part of his perfect will for us because he knows best. He's a perfect Savior. And so in this passage, in verse 8, don't miss this. Verse 8, Jesus gives us seven powerful words to build our hope, to encourage us, to give us insights into our future. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Well, unpack that with me for a minute. That is a powerful, powerful verse. That is a powerful statement. When Jesus said, I am, those two words draw upon all this imagery of the Old Testament. When God said that to Moses, I tell the people I am who I am. I am, that's a God title. And then in the Gospel of John, where the same author wrote the Gospel of John, we get all these profound statements where Jesus said things like, I am the resurrection and the life. He's claiming divinity. He's showing the world that he is God. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. He says that over and over again. That statement, I am. And for us, he is in the presence of whatever we're going through today. We can count on the fact that he is with us as the fullness of God in perfect, perfect union with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to minister to us. So I am. We take encouragement from that. It's a call to follow him into that. That no, we know he is. He says, I am the Alpha. The beginning. Not just a beginning. The beginning. Yes. He is the beginning of all things. Before anything happened, before time, he already was. Jesus is there at creation. He has always been. He always will be. He always has been. He is the Alpha and he is the Omega. The Omega. Not just the end. Not just a end, but the end. And when we know that and when we lean into that and worship him as our God and our Lord and Savior and surrender completely to him and live a lifestyle of worship, we live that out knowing that he is the Alpha and the Omega and the beginning and the end. And whatever ending to our timeline is, the end for us is actually the beginning. It's the absolute beginning of an eternity with this Jesus, who is the Alpha and the Omega and the beginning and the end. So listen to this picture of Revelation as, as we begin to close out this morning. Listen to these verses in, in verse 12 
through verse 18. Listen to this scene in Revelation chapter 1. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands, and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white as wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze re refined in the furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty, mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all of his brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me, and he said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. I want to close this this morning with that image. In that image, I hope you heard it, Jesus laid his hand laid his hand on John. There's so much imagery in that. And for John, John was, you remember Matthew, John and, and was, was with Peter and James up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And in that scene where Jesus was transfigured and transformed before them and they got a taste of heaven in that moment, it was there that it also says that Jesus touched them. He laid his hands on them. He touched them. There's something powerful about these images where we can, we can picture the touch of Jesus in those moments saying things like, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. Would you envision in this moment Jesus putting his hand on you, touching you and saying those words? I went to great extent to save you. And I have a great plan for you. I am the beginning and the end. I know it all. And I know better than you do what is going to bring joy and life and fulfillment now and into all of eternity. Would you receive a touch from Jesus by his spirit today? Can you picture that hand? And can you receive it as something that will build your courage for whatever you're going through right now? And whatever we face tomorrow, Jesus is right there, ready to put his hands on our shoulders and say things like we've heard this morning and remind us, it's going to be okay. I've got this. The victory is already secure. And you can experience that for eternity. Can I ask two questions? What needs to happen for you right now, even today, to really lean into a heart of worship. Is there anything holding you back from really embracing a deep heart of worship as a lifestyle, not just on Sunday mornings or any other gatherings, but as a lifestyle of service and declaration of the Lordship of Christ in your life? What needs to happen? Is there anything in your life that you, is more important to you right now than Jesus? Is there anything standing in the way of your ability to worship him with all your heart are you into his word do you love the bible and do you just know that it's live and taking you to jesus every time you read it it's the only book in the universe where the author is present when we read it lean into that have a conversation with god about it what is standing in the way of you having a heart of worship and I want to invite the worship team back to, to close us in a song this morning and, and, and have a little conversation about that. And a second question, are you fully surrendered to Jesus? Are you completely fully surrendered to him? Are you ready to see him? Are you ready to meet him? Because that can happen so that you have this assurance that when you see him one day, and we all will, he already knows us. He already knows me. And he will welcome me home into his presence forever. And even in the now, he, he wants to reveal things to us. He wants to reveal, not conceal. Lean in. Listen to his voice. Can I encourage you just to take a moment of, of prayer right where you are right now? And have a conversation with God. Whatever has been stirred by the Spirit in your life right now, in your heart, 
Would you talk to him about it? I'll say an amen in just a moment, but have your own conversation with God right now. He's here. music. Thank you for inspiring gifted people to write songs that take us deeper, closer to you. Thank you for raising up gifted worship teams that can take us into your presence as we sing and reflect on the words. And Lord, in, in these moments as we, as we lean into you, as we press into your heart, would you help our lives to sing? To our community, to our loved ones, to our friends, to our families, that they would see in our lives that we really do worship you alone. We really do trust you alone. And we are looking forward to seeing you again. Thanks for the hope and the assurance that that builds. In Jesus' name, amen.